Sunday. I know. Some of you will probably say, how are you doing, Pastor Chuck? And if you don't know, generally I'm a statement of fashion. And today, I'm kind of mismatched, okay? And there's reasons for it. Um, I forgot this was February. And we're not going on the cruise yet. That's not till May. But I'm getting ready to go on my cruise. But... You'll find out in a minute why I'm talking about this, because the sermon this morning is called Mismatched. And a lot of times in our life, we pick people uh, that are our friends, and we become mismatched. And a lot of times, um, I actually was going to wear some flip-flops today on one side, okay? But I didn't, and there's a reason for that. Number one, I don't own any (laughs) flip-flops. Number two, if you ever saw my feet, you would understand why I don't own any flip-flops. This is why I have sandals who are self-enclosed. Okay? Um, I have a thing called cotton toes. He's got them too, don't worry about it. (laughs) We all inherited them. I have no idea why, but it it, it is. You know how most people's feet, your toes are like this, right? Well, mine aren't. I, I actually have, this is a big toe. It kind of overlaps my little toe. I, I, I constantly tell us because my mom always gave me shoes that were too small and she deformed me <laughs> for life. And I never forgave her for that. And she and I were talking about it. I've forgiven her about it, a lot of other things as well as she's forgiven me too. But it could be that some of you here this morning are also mismatched. It could be that there are some things in your life that you look at and um, you think, why did I do this? Why am I doing this or why am I, why am I doing that? And sometimes, um, maybe some of you here this morning are connected up with the wrong they's. Because you need to understand something because sometimes we do have the wrong person in our life. And we really need to understand, God, what are you, what are you looking for? Maybe you're hanging with the wrong friends. You're hanging with the wrong squad. You've got the wrong group of people that are in your circle. And, and so you need to find who these are because it could be that you're mismatched. You see, because I don't know about you, but last week when we started this Fifty Shades of They, I was excited about it, and I'm still excited about it this week, and I'm ready for next week and and the week after as we go through this, because there's some good things from God about all of these things that we're talking about. And, And one of the things is this. God is not gray. Do you know that? With God, things are black and white. But there's a lot of times that we want to put things in gray. And and again, um, this is kind of a play on the the, the, uh, movie that's coming out from the book, Fifty Shades of Gray. And trying to justify this action or that action. Was sharing with someone yesterday, um, we were talking and They were saying, I really don't know why I'm doing this, but here's the reason why. Or I think I'm justified in this, or I think I'm justified in this, that. Let me say this to you. Never use the word but. Because a lot of times when you're using the word but, 
I would do this, but. And we all do this. We all do it a lot. But the problem is we are trying to justify why we're not doing something. When we start putting a but in there. I would do this. Well, but. Then don't do it. Flat out. We need to be more black and white instead of gray. And in our areas of life, we cover a lot of gray and we try to justify why we're doing this or why we're doing that. And sometimes we do this a lot of times even in our relationships, okay? Sometimes you need to understand, every one of you all, need to understand that you've got a hole in your heart the shape of a cross that only Jesus can fill. Quit trying to fill it up with other things. We talked about it last week. Jobs, possessions, cars. We try to fill up those things in our life, trying to find, and we can't find it. We're looking for happiness the song says, in all the wrong places. When the place we should be looking to is to the cross. Because that's where we find it. We find the things that we're looking for. Sometimes when you run with the wrong crowd, you find that a lot of times you're going to start doing the wrong things. I shared with you, man, when I was a little kid, we would get with the wrong crowd and my mom would always tell me, you know, don't hang out with this person or don't hang out with that person. And I would do it. And what would happen? I'd get in trouble. My mom and dad had a, 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 um, a set rule. Get back in the house before I get up in the morning. No. <laughs> they, they didn't do that. That's the way it is today. But my mom and dad had a certain rule. You had to be in by a certain time. Okay? Now, mine was not 11 o'clock. My mom and dad trusted me. So I got to stay out a little bit later. Okay? And so I would stay out to about 12 o'clock or so, and I'd, and I'd come home after midnight. I could not come in at 2 o'clock in the morning. My mom and dad had a rule. You do not stay out that long because there's too much trouble to get into at that time of night. And I would say, well, so-and-so's doing that. Or mom, dad, we're going to the drive-in and the last show doesn't start till 11. Well, then you ain't watching it or only watch part of it. But I'll miss the ending. I can tell you how it'll end if you don't show up. <laughs> and so there were the rules that we had to follow, whether I liked it or not. Those were the rules. And if I got out past that time and hung around with the wrong crowd, guess what happened? I got in trouble. And I would end up doing some of the wrong things. Okay? So, how do I move away from the wrong days? Okay? And I want to talk to you about that. So, if you have your Bibles, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14. If you don't have your Bibles, we'll have it up on the, up on the uh, screen. Paul is talking to a church called Corinth. They were in this city, and this church was very corrupt. They were allowing anything and everything in there, okay? It was one of those very hip cities. It was like anything goes. And they were proud of what they were doing. To them, everything was gray. There were no black and white, okay? And so Paul begins to start talking to them about some things, okay? And again, these are Paul's words inspired by the Holy Spirit. But before I read this verse, I need to ask a question. How many of you in here are single? 
right now. Okay. Now, for those of you that are single, when you read this verse, what's going to happen is about two-thirds of you, if you're in a relationship, you probably are going to hit you're in the wrong relationship. So don't get mad at the shooter or the messenger this morning, okay? Just look at what he says. He starts out and he says, do not. Do not means do not, okay? That's kind of understandable. He says, do not be mismatched with unbelievers. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship does light have with darkness? Okay? Now, in some other translations, it says, do not be yoked, okay, with uh, righteousness or, 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 or unrighteousness or, or wickedness. And here he says, do not yoke up righteousness with, with wickedness, and he begins to start talking about this because he starts asking the question, how can there be fellowship between light and darkness? And how do we do these, do these things, okay? Because when you read some of the translations, it says, do not be yoked up. Some of you are thinking that yoke is the thing that you find in eggs, that is high in cholesterol, right? And then he's not talking about um, the yolk in the eggs. And I know some of you are talking about this. I'm not into yolks, dude. I'm into the yellows or the egg whites. That's what I'm into. I, you know, I don't eat the other stuff. I just eat the egg whites because it's, there's no cholesterol in there. Good for you. I'm not talking about that, and I'm not into that. Uh, I believe that God gave me the whole egg and nothing but the egg, so help me God. I've tried scrambled eggs with egg beaters. I've tried omelets with egg beaters, and there's not anything you can do to make those things taste like an omelet, okay? So, I believe that the proper way to beat an egg is the white and the yolk together and just start beating it, okay? That's not gospel. That's not from God. That's from the second book of Chuck. <laughs> Verse number three, Amen. 12, okay? So when he says, do not be yoked, you got to understand what yoked is, okay? Yoke, when he's talking about being not yoked together, unequally, you got to remember they were basically an agricultural society. And so when they start explaining this or start talking about this, they begin to understand what it means when they start talking about a yoke. Because the yoke was basically a, a, a wooden, a piece of wooden equipment, and there were two holes in this equipment, one on both sides. And what they would do is they would take two farm animals, one on one side and one on the other side, and they would yoke them together, and then they would start plowing with those farm animals. Now, you would not find a farmer getting his donkey in an ox and putting the donkey and the ox together. Because what would happen is, who knows? Donkeys are stubborn. An, that ox may try to pull this away, and that donkey would say, I'm not going, Jack. I'm staying right here. And so what you would see is a big rut trying to be dug one way. And that farmer, whatever that oxen would dig that ditch, that's how that farmer would plant his crops. And I don't know about you, but I find it very fascinating to get out into a, a place where they, they actually have sown corn or soybeans 
or anything else that they planted. And you can stand in that row and you can look right smack dab down that row before it gets real high. See how straight it is. Why? Because that farmer took those two animals and he always focused on a point and tried his best to direct those two oxen to that point. He couldn't do it if they were two pieces of animals or two animals that were not equal. It would start going every which way. Okay? Now, some farmers today like to make designs in their fields, and God bless them if they do. I never was uh, artistic, okay? But the other reason that a, a farmer back then would not take a, a donkey and an oxen was because the donkey was considered an unclean animal. And to, and to them, what they would do is they would say, well, listen, I'm not going to take a clean animal and an unclean animal and yoke them together. You just don't do that. And this is where Jesus starts talking about, or, or Paul, through the inspiration, and in talking about these things. Now, some people will say, well, hold on a minute. Isn't God being discriminatory? Aren't we supposed to love everybody? That's not what he's saying. He tells us to love sinners. Okay? But he also, I think I've got my phone off. Yes. Okay. But he says, listen, a lot of times Christians take this too far. And what they say is, well, he's saying, do not be mismatched with unbelievers. So, so what's happening is that Christians have white hats and sinners have black hats. And so we shouldn't hang around with black hat people. And that's not what he's saying. Okay? He's saying, don't get yoked up with them. Don't get tied to them. Okay? And so, when God's talking about this, it's God's not profiling. God's not being cruel. God's trying to give us advice for our own good and trying to keep us out of trouble. Some have said, you know, I know what that means. That means that as Christians, we are to separate ourselves from the world. And so what we need to do is... I just need to go and sell everything that I've got and I need to give it to the church and I need to get me a little room in the church and I need to sit in that little room all day on my little stool and, and I need to just read the Bible and read the Bible and read the Bible and then I need to get up, go to the restroom every once in a while, okay? Got to do that. And then I got to go eat. And then I got to go back to my room. And I got to read my Bible. And I just got to stay there. I want to lead the life of a monk. May I say to you, God doesn't want you to live the life of a monk. Or a monkey. He wants you to live the life and live life to its fullest. He gave us people to enjoy. He gave us friendships to enjoy. But he wants us to harness some of this stuff that, that, we're, that we're getting into, okay? So, back in the 60s, and some of you remember those, some of you don't, and that's good, okay? Because back in the 60s, everybody was dressed funky. They, they always wore bright colors, okay? They didn't match, and nobody wore shoes. They, they wore sandals, okay? And it, it, was, it was cool to have jeans that were ragged, but you would put a patch over them, and that patch would always have a flower on it or something, you know? Everybody loved Volkswagens were awesome. Those were the cars of the day. 
okay? And then, then we started making dune buggies and all of these things, okay? And that's when Bill Clinton started smoking the peace pipe. Okay? But can I tell you something? Jesus never, ever told anybody in the Bible but one person to go and sell everything that you've got. And that was the rich young ruler. Because remember, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, keep the commandments. And the, and the guy says, I've done that. All my life, I have kept all of your laws. I have not broken any of them. And Jesus said, okay. Then do this. Go and sell everything that you've got and give it to the poor. And what did he say? The Bible said he just walked away. Why? He broke the first law. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. His possessions were his God. And Jesus knew this. And then he broke another one because he lied. And in reality, he probably broke some more. But Jesus was telling him. So, so what does it mean to be yoked? And it means to, it means to be bound it means, and it doesn't mean to isolate yourself. Okay? So when Jesus is talking about being yoked up, he's not saying isolate yourself to be just you. Because if you decide to be a hermit and just you, then you have violated what Jesus has already said. You're not obeying what it is that God's told you to do. Okay? So, it doesn't, also mean to never relate to anybody that is not a follower of Christ. And that's what some people have taken it to mean. I will continue to share this with you until the day that God calls me home. Ladies and gentlemen, the majority of people that come to know Jesus do not come to know Jesus on Sunday morning in church. The majority of people that come to know Jesus come to know Jesus outside these walls Monday through Saturday. And how do they come to know him? Through us and the relationships that we develop with them. I asked the question this morning, and, I, and I'll ask you all the question. Show me one place in the Bible where, God, or where Jesus saved an individual in the synagogue or in the temple. You will find that everyone that he talked to and everyone that came to follow him was outside. Every time when Jesus would look, it said he would look and he would, he would look with compassion. Okay? So what we've done is we've misinterpreted scripture to do crazy things as Christians. It's no wonder they call us weirdos. We act like them sometimes. Now, there's a good weirdo and a bad weirdo. Okay? And sometimes you can decide which one you are. Okay? So, one of the things that you need to understand is there, there are some people that say, everything that I do, I have to do it in a Christian way. Even when the toilet gets clogged. And I'm trying to figure out how in the world can you unclog a toilet in a Christian way? If somebody can explain that to me, I would like to know that. You can't do everything in, in, a, in a vacuum, okay? I'm not saying that you unclog it in a sinful way where you curse it, okay? But some people want to say, well, you got to do two, two plunges and then a prayer, Okay, I, I, I just, it, it, it befuddles me. Okay, so when God says, don't be mismatched, it's talking also when you're dating someone, 
and, and especially he's talking about, and, and, and I know that I get a lot of heat when I say this, but he's also talking about don't marry somebody that's, if you're a believer, don't marry somebody that's an unbeliever. Okay? Now, I've had people say, well, we'll change them after they get saved or after we get married. It doesn't happen. Okay? I, and, I, and I've shared with you. Let me, let me just kind of give you an example. Um, I'm breaking all of, all of the laws of preaching that, that I've been told that I shouldn't do, and that is use personal examples. And, and so I break, I'm going to break that right now, I'll, I'll tell you. Okay? I shared with you, um, I was 18 years of age, in love with an absolutely beautiful, gorgeous, blonde hair, blue-eyed girl that just took my heart. Uh, when we were dating in high school, she broke up with me every other week, it seemed like, okay? And then she would go back with me on the weekend, okay? When she would come to church, we'd get back together, we'd go out, and, and then come about the middle of the week, she'd break up with me. And, and, and if you ever, I, again, will tell you, growing up, I was a very homely-looking individual. I still do not understand why she married me. Uh, she saw my future that I wasn't going to stay looking like that, thank God, that I would look a little bit better. But she was 16 uh, and turning 17 in September. She was a junior in high school. We thought, man, we got it. We're Christians. We're in love. Things are going to be hunky-dory. Things are going to be fine. The first seven years of our marriage were hell. There, were good, there was heaven, and, and then there were fights. We came back in 1980 um, in February of 1980, uh, we were coming back to the States to get divorced. Uh, we have put each other through misery, just totally and completely. We were the two most miserable people in the whole world, okay? I went back to Germany, came back home, thinking that, okay, we're going to go to the lawyer. Uh, we'll get the papers drawn up. We'll decide what we're going to have to do with the kids and go on. And that would be the rest of my life in 1980. But when I came back in 1980, my wife had sat down with her dad and her dad had convinced her that you need to try one more time. See if this thing won't work. We got away from all of our friends that we thought were our friends in Germany and all of the other places that we'd been in seven years. And we came back to home where people loved us and it was really our friends and really cared. If it hadn't have been for that friendships and getting back into church and getting my, our relationships back with God, we would not be here today. I would have missed my daughter. I would have missed a lot of blessings in the last 34 years when we just called a quit. And this is what I'm talking about sometimes when even as two Christians, ladies and gentlemen, it is hard to hold it together. It is. Does it work when one is a Christian and one is a non-Christian? Sometimes, yes. But when things get rough, the Bible says, whenever two of you agree as touching any one thing, if you will pray it in my name, I'll hear and I'll answer. And that's why he says to be yoked together. Because in a marriage, you need that prayers. And especially in society and in environments today, you need that. It's hard enough because, unfortunately, a lot of times both partners have to work. That's rough. Because how are you going to split responsibilities in the house? How are you going to take this kid here and this, this kid there? Okay? 
So, there's a, there's a lot of times that what we do is we just want to just try to be everything to all people. And, and we, we, we can't do that, okay? And another reason that Jesus insists that we be matched up and yoked up is because of this. God knows both parties. Remember we sang the song, I'm a friend of God? Guys, you're either his friend or his enemy. It's black and white. There is no in between. God is coming one day to destroy his enemies. But you see, God did not create hell for man. Never intended. It was only intended for Satan and the fallen angels. God's intent when Jesus leading to the cross was that everyone could go to heaven. That's what he wanted. But he gave us a choice. And when we look at this, some of you, and I've had some people say this when we start talking about a, a Christian shouldn't be matched with a, with a non-Christian. And I've shared with you, a, a buddy of mine, man, he, he, he got, he, he was lost, divorced, saved, married. Or mar married and then saved. And some people told him, they said, what you need to do is you need to go back you need to divorce the lady that you're with right now, and you need to go back and marry your first wife. He was so messed up. And that was based on Christian advice. And I know a lot of times people will say, okay, so I'm married to a non-believer, so does that mean that what I need to do is I need to get... I need to divorce them. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's talking about. Okay? So, what did Jesus say? Look in verse number 15 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Okay? He says this in verse number 15. What agreement does Christ have with Bella? Or, or, or um, what agreement does Christ have with Bella or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Some will say, what, what agreement does Christ have with Satan? And you got to understand, Christ and Satan do not agree. They're at odds with each other. Completely and totally. So, what agreement is there between the temple of God, which are believers, and with, with those who, 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 are, who are not in the temple of God. And, and he says, listen, or idol worshipers, okay? And so a lot of times what we've got to do is, is this. He's saying, what harmony is there between Christ and Satan? Now, when there are agreement, the, the word here is harmony. And this is the word where we get the English word symphony, okay? And have you ever been to a symphony? Okay, and, and, I, and I know that um, we have somebody in our midst that has probably played in the symphony. But have you ever been to a symphony? Okay. On this side, you've got all of these instruments, right? And on this side, you've got a whole bunch of other instruments. you got this side, it's got some more. you got some percussion uh, here, 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 all in the back, okay? Now, if, if you've got the tubas and the French horns over here playing one song with a 3-4 a, a beat, and you've got the um, violins and some other strings over here playing the same song with a 4-4 four, four beat, what's going to happen? You're going to write a new chorus. Somebody might think it's cool. You're going to sit back and you're going to listen and you're going to think, 
Didn't they even practice? Okay, and, and I know sometimes when we come in, the words on the, on the screen, um, Naomi was playing right. I wrote them wrong as I had them up there, and then I got to remember, man, that's not what we practiced. Okay, so she was right. There just wasn't a lot of harmony sometimes. But that's not the problem. The problem is this. When you have the symphony, you do not have four different conductors. You have one conductor telling everybody what to do. And that's what Jesus is talking, God's talking about in his word here. Who's the conductor? God. What's he want us to do? He wants us to be in harmony. He wants this to be a symphony. This is why Jesus said, and again, this is the Lord's prayer. Father, I pray, I pray that those that you have given me and those that are coming after, Father, that they would become one like you and I are one. That's what Jesus is praying, is that we become a symphony as Christians and as believers, being in harmony. And when we do this, you find that life is a lot better in all of this, okay? So now, let's talk about some tough stuff. And, and some of the tough stuff is that sometimes there's these questions of why, and that's why I was talking to you today, that I'm a guy of fashion, okay? I like to, sometimes, I, 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 was, I was fashionable before fashion was started, okay? Um, back when I was going in high school, we had long sleeve shirts and sweaters, and what I would do is I would get hot, and so I would start rolling up the sleeve of my sweater. And then I realized 10 years later, everybody's doing that. Okay? Remember when you were wearing certain clothes back in the 70s? Like, okay. For those of you that weren't here in the 70s, then let's give you a history lesson. In the 1970s, we had these things called bell bottoms. Right? Yes. They, man, they, were, they would be really tight to your legs, and then they would flare out. You could hide everything in the world under those pants. <laughs> Go to school, man, you could have every answer to every test. Right? I mean, and, and then what ended up happening? I don't have any bell bottoms anymore. Nehru jackets. How many of y'all remember those? Polyester suits, right? Those were in style. And we were styling and profiling. And we look good, right? Um, my brother had an afro. Okay? They didn't do it until I left home. I didn't have to do it. But I, the three younger brothers that I had all had afros back then because those were in style. Okay? And, and everybody, everybody would wear those things. Because, and then you come into the 80s, and bell bottoms go away. Okay? Nehru jackets just kind of go away. Holes in your jeans were in style in the 50s, in the 60s, and in the 70s. And then we had started putting patches on them, Right? And then you didn't want to wear an old pair of jeans that were faded out. Now you can't find a pair of jeans that's not faded out. It's got to be pre-washed, stone-washed, or, or as my wife isn't in here, pre-washed and stone-washed. <laughs> as some of y'all would say, okay? So you take a new pair of jeans and you've got to throw it in, in the washer, in the dryer, five times before you wear it. And then they're broke in. Honey, we would take them straight off the hanger and wear them because we wanted them to look nice. Now, when a kid gets a hole in the pair of jeans, they'll wear them forever. Those are in style. And we didn't realize these things, okay? So... There's a lot of times that when we hang around with people, 
We need to understand that this is why we don't wear flip-flops. Because sometimes what happens is we flip and flop <laughs> with our friendships. Okay? And, and why does God say that he doesn't want us mismatched? Have you ever tried running in a pair of flip-flops? If you would like to pay a visit to the urgent care or the emergency room, take off running in your flip-flops. Because more than likely, you're going to fall. You can't get any traction in a pair of flip-flops. It just, it just doesn't work. Now, how many of you all, when it snows, wear flip-flops in the snow? Now, you might wear them when it's cold, but your feet get cold, right? When you start wearing things or doing things that just doesn't agree at the moment or at the time, what happens is, or we're disagreeing with God, you may think it's cool to wear those things, but it's only cool to wear those things when you're on the beach. You can't do this all the time. So, what God wants is not for us to have our friendships with, I'm going to have my friendship with this person because if I have my friendship with that person, everybody's going to think I'm cool, okay? Now, not too many of you all would be caught dead wearing this kind of a shirt, right? You can admit it. Go for it. Who would like to wear this shirt? I'll be right back. <laughs> never say I never gave you the shirt off my back. <laughs> Okay, now I look better. <laughs> okay, but can I, can I tell you something? Flip-flops always hold you back. And when you have friendships where you flip and flop, they'll hold you back. You, you won't actually be able to do the things that God wants you to do, okay? Now, I should have changed my shoes while I was back there too because I still look weird. Uh, but there's other reasons that you don't wear flip-flops, right? You get rocks, you get rocks in them. And they, they start to irritate your feet. There's not too many things you can do with flip-flops. The same thing with these relationships when you start flipping and flopping. It, it causes a lot of issues, okay? Now, sometimes we need to understand that Maybe you've been in a friendship that you know you need to get away from. But you're saying, Pastor, I can't do that. You don't understand. I'm not going to give up on them. That's not what I'm asking you to do. What happens most of the time, remember when we talked about choosing last week? We become them. And we become they. When God is asking us to help make them us and him. And the us is with us and God. Okay? So, in Isaiah chapter 52, in verse number 11, 
Here's what God tells us to do in kicking off the uh, flip-flop. He was talking to the nation of Israel. He says, therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. And he says, and I will receive you. Okay. What he was trying to say to the nation of Israel was this. You need to come out of the land of Babylon. Because in the land of Babylon, what had you done? You have picked up their religion. You've picked up their idols. You've picked up their ways. And you need to come out from among, from among them, okay? So sometimes, sometimes you need to pull out your phone. Or sometimes you need to go down through your Facebook and you need to start looking at who's in your friends. And sometimes you need to start deleting some names. Because what happens if somebody puts an inappropriate comment on your Facebook? Who sees it? Everybody. And then what happens? Oh, Pastor Chuck is friends with this person. Look at him. That's why I've gone through my, I've gone through my names and I've deleted people. <coughs> Some of the things that they think are funny, they're not appropriate for me. And they're not appropriate for other people to think that those are my friends. That's why I'm very careful sometimes on when someone asks a friend request. I'll go back and look who they are and what they've posted. Who are they friends with? Okay. And, and what have they posted? And sometimes we need to do this. And, and um, we need to move away from the things of some of these friendships and we need to start moving more towards the things of God and, and become more matched, not mismatched in, in our relationships, okay? Now, we started talking about being yoked together. And, and let, me, let me finish with this illustration. Remember what a yoke is? A yoke is a piece of farm equipment which has two holes to it, right? And you put two animals or in this case, we're going to put two people in the yoke. One of those people that's going in that yoke is you. Who should you be yoked up with? With Jesus. If you put you in the yoke and Jesus on the other end, guess where your path is going to go? Straight to God. And when the end is finished, you can stand at the beginning point and the end point and you will see no deviation. None. Now, when a farmer sows in a straight path, he gets a higher produce or harvest than if he just starts, I say he, it could be a she, okay? Politically correct here. Whoever that farmer is, if they just start sowing here and sowing there, the production is not going to be as much in the harvest as it would be if all they did was just sow in straight rows. Right? Because if me and Jesus are hooked up and yoked up 
and we're on a straight path, okay? And you're right next to us, and you're hooked up, and Jesus is hooked up with you. He can do that. You've got another straight path. Now, what will grow between the paths? Weeds, right? Who's going to come by and take out the weeds? Jesus. I'm in the path. You're in the path. Remember? Remember they wanted to separate the wheat from the tares? And what did Jesus say? Leave them alone. We'll take care of it. As the weeds grow up, he'll take care of those things. Why? Because I'm focused on him. I'm not focused on the weeds. That's his job. He'll take care of that. And he'll take care of those in your life. He promised, if you will keep focused on me, you will have a product productive life like no one else. So the question arises today as I get a song of an invitation. What are your friendships like right now? How mismatched are you? Are you trying to justify things? And, and, and you can't. You can't justify things in, in the face of God. As I... I could say... I don't have enough time for God because I've got all these other things I've got to do. I've got 24 hours just the same way you do, right? And if I start filling my life with all the, these other things and I say I don't have any time for God, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a preacher, I'm a worker, I'm a friend, I'm a this and I'm a that. And you say, well, I don't have any time. If you start lining things up in priority, you'll find out you have all kinds of time. And so many times we say, I don't have time because I'm so mismatched in life. And what God is saying is this, do not be yoked up. He says, listen, focus, focus. Will it make life okay? No. Will I still have issues? Yes. Do I still have issues? Yes. I work every day with uh, some people who have no clue who Jesus is. Their life is party. That's all they want to do. Do I go up to them and say, I'm Jesus. I'm a born again believer. Y'all need to shut the language up. You guys need to quit talking about getting drunk all the time. We just need to talk about Jesus here. No. I go up to him and I'll talk to him. I say, how was your weekend? Yeah, it's okay. How was yours? Great. It's awesome. I can remember everything I did this weekend. Used to. I can't anymore. I'm getting old. But do I have to... Do I always have to go to God and say, God, I'm so sorry for everything I did this weekend? No, I don't. I, I have a good time, a great time. With why? With hanging out with y'all. Okay? I, I, would, I would not like to hang out with anybody better than you guys. Okay? You're awesome. You, you guys look good. But God can make you look better. The question is, what do you want to do? This song says this, softly and tenderly, he's calling, and he is. He's not going to beat you over the head. He's asking you, what do you want to do? You want to come right now or not? It's up to you. He will help you with your issues, but they don't all go away. Hello, my name is Chuck Cott. I'm the pastor here at Calvary Baptist Church. We'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out 
to view this message. We'd also like to invite you to our church here, located at 1601 Jackson Lane in Middletown, Ohio. We're a Southern Baptist church with a big heart, and we love everyone that walks in the door. You will find that people here friendly, enjoyable, and full of life. So at any time, if you need to get a hold of us, you can contact us at the church here at area code 513-423-7251. Our time of services are Sunday morning. We have uh, Sunday school or life groups at 9.30, followed by worship service at 10.45. Our water program uh, consisting of Puggles all the way through Trek. With, it runs on Sunday evening at 6, 6 p.m., as well as a, a worship service that will be going on for the parents and others at that time. Then on Wednesday night, we have a uh, Bible study, small group, uh, which will be at 7 p.m. And then we also have small groups during the week. Anytime you'd like information, again, just give us a call, 513-423-7251.